So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 10 through 19. We're going to pray and, and we're going to ask God to, to, to speak to us this morning. So Philippians chapter, 10, chapter 4 verse 10, it says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I've learned how to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to, get, to live in prosperity. In, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourself also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no other church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. Even in Thessalonica, you sent, uh, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent me, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we, we just thank you for, uh, we thank you for your grace. And we thank you for your word and how your word is true and how your word convicts, how your word draws, and how your word has brought us all to the place we're at this morning. So, God, we just, uh, just want to say thank you for uh, your goodness. We want to say thank you for your grace. And, Lord, we just ask this morning that you would speak to us, that you'd use this morning to bring glory to your name that you'd use this morning to teach us, to show us, to guide us. So, again, thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. You know, as we, uh, as we continue the messages on stewardship, I want to I briefly define what steward, a steward is. Uh, but I, like I said, I want to spend the most of our time this morning talking about contentment, because I think contentment, and we're going to spend most of our time in Philippians chapter 4. I think contentment's a huge problem that we have, not just in, in the church, but in America, you know, just being content with what we have, being content with who we are, and mainly because Paul, you know, if you think about it, Paul was a steward of the gospel, and the Philippians were stewards of the resources they had that provided Paul the means to do what he was doing, so let's go, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Genesis 1.1. Very beginning, I believe that stewardship, I believe the whole idea of stewardship starts from the very beginning. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Created the heavens and the earth. The whole concept of stewardship begins at creation. Creation is a celebration not only in Genesis, but all throughout scriptures. Psalms 24, 1, it says, the earth, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness and all its fullness, and the world and all those who dwell therein. Psalms 50, 12 tells us, If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. Psalms 89, 11 tells us that the heavens are yours, the earth is your footstool, and the world and all it contains, you have founded them. God is the author, creator, the owner of all things. It's his. We, what we own, we own as stewards. We own as managers. And God has given us these things so that we can manage, so we can take care of these in a way that honors him, in a way that glorifies his name. And that's, that's how we should see our possessions. And when I say our possessions, I'm talking about our children. I'm talking about not just I'm not just talking about money today. I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about the world. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your marriage. I'm talking about every aspect of your life, everything that you have. 
You're to manage it in a way that honors God. Amen. Gifts you have, spiritual gifts you have. We're to, we're to grow in our spiritual gifts, and we're to exercise those spiritual gifts in a manner that, that encourages the body, but it also glorifies God. We're to manage our, our, the physical gifts that we have in a, in a way that, that, yeah, they can increase, but it, maybe they increase, but we're to do that in a way that honors God. Sometimes they increase, sometimes they don't. Whether you have a lot, whether you have a little, doesn't matter. You're to manage, you're to use, you're to be a steward in a manner that honors God. Amen. I do think we need to be stewards of our spiritual gifts. You know, we read in, in, in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, you know, prophecy and service and teaching and exhortation we should we should grow in our spiritual gifts so the body of, of christ can grow and the body of christ can be encouraged Amen. but we're also to be stewards of our possessions i mean we're managers he has loaned these things to us and he expects us to manage these things in a way that honors his name this stewardship, again, begins in the garden. And when God gave Adam and Eve dominion over the entire creation, he didn't give them ownership, he gave them dominion. They were given responsibility to manage it in a way that honors God. And I was talking to somebody before the service, and that has not changed. The, the way we are to, to live in this dominion that we have has not changed. We are to do it. We're to take care of what we've got. I mean, when I moved here, I struggled with one thing when I moved, well, more than just one thing. I struggled with a lot of things when I moved here, but I pay for recycling. I struggled with really bad with paying. It's supposed to be a money-making opportunity, right? And it really gave me, until, you know, I started thinking about what I was struggling with, I should want to recycle. Yeah, I got to pay for it, but I should want to take care of this world because it's the only one we have. Now, I, I really believe this. I just think we, we have been given gifts, we've been given stuff, and we should take care of it. And we should do it. I'm going to say this over and over and over and over and over again. We should do this in a manner that honors God. That type of stewardship, again, has not changed. The problem with most of us the problem that Richard has is contentment. I don't know about you. I'll say, yes, the problem that you have is contentment. You know, always wanting more, something different, something new, bigger, faster, stronger. My computer's slowing down, so I need a new one. It actually is, but I don't really need a new one. I want a new one. I, I mean, you know, we all have those kind of things. Contentment, being satisfied in what God has given you is very elusive. Understanding that the, the line between wants and needs gets blurred really quick. Amen. You know, I used, to, I used to have, I want a new car. I actually do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, I struggle here. Problem is, I don't need one. My old car didn't have air conditioning. My new car does. I mean, it's pretty cool in the summertime. It has a heater, too. So in the wintertime, it's all right. It drives, you know, it's got a few bumps and dents and stuff like that, but it's okay. It gets me to and from where I want to go. I don't need a new car. I want it. And I struggle with this here. I believe contentment comes from a right relationship with God. I mean, just I, I just totally believe it. When we understand who God is and, what he, and how he's provided for us, I believe that contentment comes from that right relationship with God. And if you're struggling with contentment like I am, you know there's an issue. And so I just encourage you today, maybe this afternoon, to go home and, and ask. Because I've been asking God, okay, Lord, what is it that I am struggling with that, that's causing me to want more? Because I have this insatiable hunger to want more. Paul tells Timothy, if you have food and covering, with these you shall be content. I mean, you know, 
that's what you need. You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need the basics. Everything else is, is, is uh, dessert. Everything else is added to this. Hebrews, Hebrews tells us, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content in what you have. For he said, this is God said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. That's, what, that's a promise you can hang on to. He's going to take care of you. It might, he might not take care of you the way you think he should take care of you, but he's going to take care of you. It might hurt. It might not be exactly what you want, but he is going to take care of you. Boy, if you can grab a hold of that, the whole contentment issue just kind of slides to the side. Paul, this is something I was reading this week. Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians 12, he tells us he was well content with weakness, with insult, with distress, with persecution, with difficulties for Christ's sake. And then he says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the idea that I say that right relationship with the Lord. You know, if you're struggling here, I just encourage you to get along and ask God, what is it? So this morning, we're going to look at three characteristic traits, and if you'll put the, the side up, slide up, we'll talk about those. Hopefully, we'll have three a slide up here. Maybe we, there it is. Three characteristics of contentment. You know, I have to confess again, I was sitting over there thinking, did I spell characteristic right? <laughs> I mean, if you know me, I can add and subtract most of the time, but I cannot spell uh, to save my life. So three characteristic of, of, of contentment. The first one, a content person is confidence in God's providence. Uh, somebody that's content is, is confident that he's going to take care of you that he's going to provide for you, that he will make sure that you have what you need. A content person is satisfied with little. And lastly, a content person is preoccupied with the well-beings of others. And if you'll notice these, one, the first one is kind of Godward oriented. You know, confident in God's provision. Your, your, your mind, your heart is, is looking up towards God's provision. The second one is inward focused. You know, dealing with the issues of the heart. Because, you know, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. You know, that's, I think it's just a huge thing. When we struggle with this whole idea of contentment, either we don't have a right relationship with the Lord, or we don't have something, we have something going on in our heart that's not right. And then the last one is, is a, a preoccupation, or it is an outward-focused idea of contentment. So let's look at that. At that first one in verse, uh, oops, in verse 10, it says, But I will rejoice in the Lord greatly, now that you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you lacked opportunity. And that content person is, is confident in God's providence. For years, years, some years had passed since Paul's ministry in Philippi. And if you remember Philippi, you remember what happened in Philippi. Remember, he, he goes there, he's preaching Christ, and there's this, this girl, she's demon-possessed, and she's following him around for several days, irritating Paul, saying, these are servants of the Most High God, speaking of Paul and Silas. These are servants of the Most High God. And finally, Paul gets upset with this young lady, rebukes the demon in this child, and uh, cast it out, and her owners realized that they had lost a source of income. Story goes on, they got upset because they lost their money. Well, they, Paul and Silas were both beaten with rods and thrown into prison. About midnight, earthquake came, and there was a jailer there. There's another p person in this, in this story. About midnight, he's in jail. Paul and Silas are singing and praising hymns. An earthquake happens, and, and uh, the jailer thinks that uh, they have escaped, and it was going to cost him his life. And Paul yells at him, no, no, we're here. And the jailer runs up to him and asks him, what must I do to be saved? 
They're all, they all knew why Paul was there. They all understood the reason he was there is because he was preaching Christ. And Paul says to him, trust in the Lord Jesus. It's exactly what I'd tell you today. Trust in the Lord Jesus. If you're here and you're not believing, you need to ask the question, what must you do to be saved? And the simplest answer is trust in the Lord. Trust in God's providence. He is going to take care of you. Well, this church, the Philippian church, had supported him when he left Philippi. After this incident, he left and he, and he ministers in the city of Thessalonica and Berea and then into Athens and to Corinth. And as time passed, it says that they were concerned about Paul, but they lacked opportunity to provide for this church. doesn't say why they uh, lacked the opportunity. It just says they lacked opportunity. Uh, but recently, Epaphroditus arrived bringing with him a generous gift from the church. And it says in verse uh, 18 that Paul greatly rejoiced in the Lord greatly. I understand this idea of what Paul's saying. I understand what Paul means when he says he rejoiced greatly. It wasn't because of the gift. The gift was evidence that people cared. The gift was evidence that somebody was praying for him. That they cared about his family, they cared about Silas, they cared about this team. You know, when we were, when we were overseas, uh, 13 months in a row, 13 months in a row, 13 different individuals gave us large sums of money each month. People I did not know. I mean, just out of the blue, it got to the point, I was asking Sheila, it's like, okay, who's it going to be this time? I mean, it's seriously, it, it was really neat to see how God was providing for us. Richard rejoiced greatly because of God's provision for him. And I don't know, if, and I'm telling you this story, I can't tell you how big this is, how huge this is, how encouraging this is to when you're out, you left your family behind and you're doing stuff and you're way out in a country that nobody speaks English. I can't tell you how encouraging it is. And I think of a, uh, of a young couple that's off in the middle of nowhere, the internet's down, they don't, I mean, it's, it's hard. And when you realize somebody cares and somebody's reading your newsletter and somebody's passing your newsletter around and not only do they care and not only they're giving to you, but they're praying for you, it's greatly encouraging. Greatly encouraging. Showed us two things. We talked a little bit about those two things, but this 13-month period showed, showed me two things. One, people cared. They were praying for us. They were passing our newsletter around. Uh, it could have been word of mouth, but they were praying for us. They were praying for my two-year-old and my five-year-old, Amanda and Joshua. They were praying for my wife. They were praying for the ministry we had, and it gave, as I say, it gave me courage to charge the mountain. It gave me courage to do what God had called me to do. And as a result, a lot of people were saved. Eleven churches were started, four schools in the short time we were there. Just was awesome ministry, awesome time. And it's all because people cared about us. And I knew it. Well, the other thing is, it showed me that God was going to take care of me. He lined up 13 different individuals in 13 months, and he provided for me, for my family. Paul greatly rejoiced. Richard greatly rejoiced. And again, telling the story here this morning, I can't, I can't tell you how big it was, how much of a, a, a faith builder it was at the time. But it's just huge. And Paul, he's, he's there in prison in Rome, and now he's, he's been amply supplied. It's just a faith builder. Paul's attitude reflects his confidence in God's provision and his sovereign providence that God is going to take care of him. He was certain that God in due time would arrange his circumstances to meet his needs. And that is true for us today. In his due time, he will arrange your circumstances to take care of your needs. 
what you need. It might not look the way you think it's going to be, but it will be exactly what God has for you and you need. I, I, I just truly believe this. You know, the, the problem with this, those who try to control it, manipulate it, it, it might happen the way you want it to happen. Usually it falls apart. Usually it doesn't work that way. And usually you can tell. I mean, when you're waiting on God's providence and when you see his hand, it's like, wow, I didn't do anything to make that happen. I mean, that, it just shows up. And, but when you're manipulating and trying it, you're usually exhausted, you know, when it does happen. Confident trust in God's provision, I believe, is, is foundational to contentment. You know, again, I'm going to say this. If you're struggling with contentment, if you're struggling with the whole idea of being satisfied, I just encourage you, are you, are you trusting in God's providence? Are you trusting in yourself? You know, there's, there's, a, there's a disconnect somewhere. And, and we're going to talk about, I think this is a huge issue we have in America. Well, let's go on. Let's talk about uh, a content person is satisfied with little. This is verse 11 and 12. It says, not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. I know how to get along with, uh, with humble means. And I also know how to live in prosperity. In, every, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. It says here, in this passage, it says he learned to be content in whatever he did. You don't learn contentment by reading a book. You learn contentment by the experiences you go through. He was living, he had been in prison, he was in prison in Rome, uh, living in a small apartment, chained to a soldier, existing on a, a meager diet. And, and if you remember, he's writing to the Philippian church, and the whole Philippian church remembers the incident. They, I'm sure that some of those in the church remember him being beaten with rods. I'm sure they remember him being thrown in, in, in jail. They were, some of them were probably there. So this whole, I, this whole story and Paul's story about contentment has weight with these guys. And none of that, his situation, none of it affected his contentment because he was satisfied with what he had. His contentment was not affected by his physical shortcomings. True contentment, I truly believe this, comes from God. And it enables us to be satisfied in the middle of problems. Amen. And, you know, this is unthinkable in our society today. The U.S. is probably the wealthiest country in the world. And I would probably add, I don't know this for sure, it's probably the most discontent. I mean, it is. We've got more stuff. Uh, and adding to this contentment, again, is the blurring of the lines between wants and needs. Again, I already told you I want a car. I don't need a car. And, you know, <clears throat> sole purpose of advertisement is to make you discontent. I was looking this up this morning. The average person who watches TV in his lifetime will listen to 35,000 commercials. 35,000. That's three zeros on the end. That is, now if you do a little math, sorry, I'm a math person. You divide that by 24, you get, these are, these are days. I mean, like from 8 o'clock in the morning all the way around to 8 o'clock in the morning again. Complete days. 1,458 days of continual commercials. Every, everybody, you know, they, this is the average person. Now, again, a math person, some of us are above average, aren't we? So that means we've listened to a few more, and some of us, now in this, this case, it's okay to be below average because you haven't listened to so many commercials. Now, you do a little bit more math. This is four years of continual advertisement. And the sole purpose of advertisement is to make you discontent so you'll buy the products they want you to sell. 
or, their, or the products that they're selling. Four years of your life is spent watching commercials. Average person. Again, some of you are above average, some of you are below average. And Paul knew that the chief end of man was not to get more stuff. And I will be the first to tell you I like stuff. I like new stuff. I think stuff's cool. I, I really do. But the chief end of man is not to get more stuff. It's to glorify God. Amen. Chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him, uh, and to enjoy him forever. And because of that, because he knew he was satisfied with the little, I got a question. You know, if we have food and covering, with that we'll be content. He learned by experience. He learned to live above his circumstances. I, I think this is a huge question for us to learn today. I've got a question for you. What are you chasing? What are you chasing after? I mean, real simple. What are you chasing after? Are you chasing after the things of God or are you th chasing after the things of the world? you, you got to ask this question. Because if you don't ask this question, you're going to watch four years of commercials and you're going to be the, uh, a discontented person. What are you chasing after? It says in, in verse 12, I know how to get along in a humble means to be hungry, to suffer need. And if you think about Paul's stories, now just think for a minute. Listen for a minute to Paul's story. Acts chapter 9, road to Damascus. Paul going to persecute the church. He meets Christ on the road. He ends up in Damascus preaching Jesus. They want to kill him. The Jews there want to kill him. He has to escape through a wall at night goes on to uh, Philippi, or well, he goes to Lystra, excuse me, first. This is the Acts chapter 14, first missionary journey. He's stoned. Stoned, they thought he was dead. They carried, out, uh, carried him out of the city as dead. He goes on to uh, Philippi, second missionary journey. We've already talked about this. It says he was beaten and thrown in jail. And you know, and the thing about it is, things didn't get better from here. In Thessalonica, the Jews became jealous, and they wanted to get rid of him. He goes on to uh, uh, Berea. They chase him to Berea. Things don't go better there. Uh, in Athens, he was mocked and ridiculed on Mars Hill. But in all of this, in all of the problems that he was having, he was still preaching Christ. He was still pointing people to Christ. He was content with who he was, and he was content with what he had. He still preached Christ crucified. We could read in 2 Corinthians 11 about his whole life. It says in one, one verse in here, it says five times he received from the Jews 39 lashes. Five times. That's 195 lashes. He was beaten three times. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked three times. He spent a night and a day in the deep. And in all his troubles and in all his, his, uh, his uh, afflictions, he still was content and he still preached Christ crucified. Paul learned the secret of being content. He learned the secret of rising above his situation in the midst of his affliction. And I, again, I just tell you, this is a question that we all have to ask ourselves. What are we chasing? What are we looking at? What do we want? What are we trying to get? Yeah, I, I can promise you, once you buy that new toy, whatever it is, a couple of days later, you're going to want a different one. You, you are. You'll be content. You'll like it for a while, but then you'll think, golly, I wish I would have got one with the radio that does this and and the seats that warm, and you know, and I wish I would have done this. And you're never satisfied because you're watching all these commercials that make you discontent. It's a problem of the heart. Well, let's go on. A content person is preoccupied with the well being of others. This is verses 
13 through 19. It says, I can do all things through him who strengthens us. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with my afflictions. For you yourself know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no other church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift for me more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. You know, in these final few, few verses, Paul was concerned for others. He's looking for their well-being. And, and those who live only for themselves, I, I, you're always going to be wanting more. I don't, I don't think you'll ever be content. You might be content momentarily, but you're always looking for the next thing. You're always wanting the next thing. And again, I'm going to tell you, contentment comes with a right relationship with the Lord. Only with a right relationship with the Lord. You understand who you are, and you understand God's providence. You understand that He's going to take care of you. And once you figure that out, once you answer that question, everything else, I would like to say everything else kind of falls in line. It, it does, but you have to fall in step with it. it, it you just do. And he also exhorted them, and if you look at this, he also exhorted them. He, he tells the Philippians, do nothing out of selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. See, I, I, I really believe when you start taking care of others, when you, when you reach out, when you reach out and you minister to other people and, and you have a hurt, I believe God reaches in and touches the hurt in your own heart. Amen. And this is one of the things he's telling you. Do, not be, uh, do nothing from selfish or empty conceit. He also tells the Philippians in verse 5, he says, Have this attitude in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek for profit, which that increases to your account. Their, their gift brought Paul joy, not because of personal benefit, but because of spiritual benefit, spiritual benefit to them. And I think what Paul, again, was saying is when you reach out, God reaches in. And if you're hurting, you're needing, if you're needing something, if you're needing God to touch a hurt in your own heart, I, I do. I encourage you to, to reach out. Be a part. Reach out and minister to others. God will, God will reach in and minister to your hearts. Proverbs 11 tells us, There is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due and yet its result is only want. The gracious man will be prosperous and he who waters will himself be watered. Exactly what we're talking about. Proverbs 19, it says, One who is gracious to a poor man lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his good deeds. God says, or excuse me, Paul says, I've learned, I've received everything in full. I have an abundance. I am amply supplied. The, the Philippians had sacrificially given their earthly possessions to support God's, to, pursue, to support Paul in his pursuit. Let's pray. Lord, we, God, we just thank you. Uh, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that we can, we can trust you. And we can put our hope in you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters this morning that we would do just that. Uh, Lord, in, in not just our physical gifts that we have, but even in the spiritual gifts that we have, in, in all aspects of our life, God, that we would put our hope in you, that we would put our trust in you, 
God, and that we would, as Paul says, that we would learn contentment, that we would learn to, to walk above our means, to learn to walk above our circumstances and all that's going on around us, and to do it in a manner that honors you. Uh, so, Lord, again, we thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, again, we thank you for your grace. We pray in Jesus' name.